everyone, Jamie Maloney, your host of the all new That Business Show 2.0, where business becomes show business. Each weekday morning, 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on thatbusinessnetwork.com and made available on demand on iTunes as well as on YouTube. Simply look up that YouTube channel to find all of our videos in high definition. You can also find the videos on YouTube as a uh, video cast. A lot of people don't know that uh, iTunes is also open to videos in addition to just audio only programs. So look up that business show 2.0 as a video cast as well over on iTunes. So today we're going to be talking about patents and trademarks. We got Chris Tanner with Tanner Patent in studio with us today. So Chris, welcome into the program today. Thanks so much for having me. So patents and, and trademarks, I mean, it's not the, you know, the most sexy thing out there, but it's something every business owner needs to be aware of and needs to have. I know uh, last year I went ahead and got that business show uh, trademarked, and it was a lengthy process. It took some time. So let's talk about some of the basics that a business owner needs to be aware of with a patent and with a trademark. And so when somebody begins a business, uh, from my standpoint, the first thing they probably should do is get a logo. Should they immediately, you know, trademark that logo, or what should they do with regard to that? Depends on their cash flow, Jamie. But in my um, traditional advising sense, no. Actually, market TM, which is a common law trademark expression, which means that I have staked this out as my brand, my brand identity, and I am making this my territory. A federal registration is probably a good idea at some point, but what I like my customers to do and my clients is to occasionally pivot and realize that, well, you know, I know I realize that logo is not as popular as what I thought it was. Well, if they had spent a bunch of money on the trademark for it, you know, that'd be money unwisely spent. Okay. Make sure that they're locked into a brand, and then, yeah, think about doing a federal registration. And the good news is, I have any number of clients who are doing their own registrations and not using an attorney at all. Is that even advisable to do? I mean, from your standpoint, we would say no, I would think. But <laughs> Actually, I say yes. No. And in fact, I want them to because my pitch, my angle is that the legal services business model is collapsing and people are finding more and more ways and having more and more access to legal information and ways to protect themselves. And I like a self-initiated client who has done some of their own legal work themselves. And I push people, actually, no, it does not hurt business at all. I push people to do their own trademark filings. In a lot of cases, they say, what a hassle, what a headache. No. But they've seen it. They now have some idea what my tasks are mm -hmm. and kind of have a greater appreciation for what I do. What about using acronyms for your uh, your logo? For instance, when I began to develop that business show, I was looking at different designs, and one of them was TBS. And somebody said, Jamie, I mean, you're obviously not going to ever probably compete with, you know, Ted Turner and TBS. But if you were ever to come, you know, you know, big show, he could say that you're in the media business. You've got TBS. He's got TBS. Is that something that we should be mindful of, too, just down the road, the use of acronyms and other people in that same industry that may be also using that same acronym? It really is, Jamie. You need to be careful. And in your case, yes, um, that would be one where you would really be better off targeting your branding to spell it out entirely. Acronyms and trying to develop that acronym, which is a separate mark and a separate brand identity, KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken, right. um, is dangerous. And yes, the competition threshold goes up. A lot. But if it's outside of the industry, say I was, you know, TBS, but I was in, you know, in an accounting practice, you know, then there, I could probably develop a TBS brand in accounting, which is unrelated to, you know, the media production, which is TBS, you know, Ted Turner Broadcasting System. Well, okay, let's say, um, uh, I would say still there are, needs to be some cautions. In a particular, let's say it was accounting, mm -hmm. but it was with the initials UA. Right. Under Armour is extremely vigilant about any acronym expression in any business anywhere. And their mark, Under Armour mark, has the level of famosity that they can say, I don't care what class you're in, people are gonna confuse you with us, take it down. Mm -hmm. And they send, and are very aggressive, nasty letters. Even if it was accounting, even if it was ballpoint pens, um, Under Armour says, people are gonna think that we've now made a business shift into ballpoint pens or something, take it down. Right. So. Be careful on your acronyms. Yeah, so that's what I, luckily I got that advice early on, so I spelled it out. I was, I was about to go with like a TBS thing, and somebody said, no, 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 you don't want to do that. So spell it out, that business show. So be make sure that you pay uh, close attention to that. So what is it about the process of getting something trademarked that takes so long? I did my logo and my thing uh, last year. It was like a year process. Uh, talk to us a little, a little bit about the process of getting a trademark. 
I used to be a patent examiner and I work with a lot of trademark examiners. I talked to two different ones yesterday. Part of it's the government backlog and part of it is that they are under production quota where trademark examiners have to go through four applications a day. And they're swamped because the United States is the commercial center for uh, trademark and intellectual property. I think you know I speak Japanese. I practiced in Japan a long time. No, I didn't know you did. Oh, yeah, I practice patent law in Japan. Oh, nice. And they file in the U.S. Their priority is the U.S. commercial and protection system, even though China is the same way. Even though, yeah, they have their own intellectual property system. So with that said, that's why it takes a year because our federal government is swamped with applications. Um, and so when an examiner is under production quota and they're told you have to do first in, first out, it takes a while to get to your stuff. And I did a trademark on the name of the program and also on my uh, slogan where business becomes show business. It was two separate things and we had to pick different categories or areas. that it was, class. Yeah. yeah, the class it is. And so there's, I guess there are a variety of different classes. How do you know which classes to pick? Just listen to the attorney and say what you should do? Actually, Jamie, this is one people can figure out themselves. If they do a Google Google search on international trademark classes. There's a total of 45. And again, this is where I like saying this. Hey, everybody, I really like telling you, you don't need an attorney. Jamie just made a suggestion that you might want to check with an attorney on that, and that's fine. You can do that. But if you're reasonably astute and bright and decent with internet searching, you can completely figure out the international class system without an attorney at all. How defensible are the trademarks then after they're established? I mean, you see somebody using a variation of this. Does it have to be specifically, you know, that name or can they use, what if they say this business show? Would I have a, a claim against somebody that, that started this business show? This and that kind of go hand in hand. <laughs> Not bad. I like the question. I'll open it up two ways. One, level of famosity on the part of the uh, competitor and is also you. And then second is how much of a variation is it? In your case, you've actually had this brand in this show for at least five years, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so what you've developed is known as secondary meaning after five years. Let's say you had just developed it six months ago, and it's nice, and it was mm -hmm. working well, but you only had the brand about six months. It'd be harder for you to say that people are going to be confused between this business show and that business show. But five years, that starts to get a little longer. And, little plug for Jamie here, mm -hmm. he's starting to get a pretty broad developed base of uh, users and appreciators, which you can verify by their IP addresses. With your brand cachet and your brand identity, you have more strength mm -hmm. to knock that person out or at least send them a takedown letter. Yeah, we got that business show, then somebody starts this business show, then we're going to have this and that business show. So we have three different things out there. Maybe I should uh, brand them all. This business show, that business show, this and that business show. So I'll get them all. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell everybody, Jamie, you can brand them all, mm -hmm. and you can brand at least the start and get some common law rights just by marking TM in the lower right-hand corner. It doesn't cost a dime. No attorneys I've needed. been told that before. You're supposed to actually do that, right? I've been told that before. And I don't understand why it's not here, yeah, but okay. Yeah, I've been told. They call me out on my show here. <laughs> but a TM, yeah. yeah, I've been told that before. So why is that? Well, you want to at least let the public know that I'm asserting my common law rights. Now, regarding the actual federal registration, that's different, and that has an R and a circle, mm -hmm. and that costs money, and as you know, takes, I'm going to say I'm getting them out now in less than a year. I'm getting them mine out for my clients in about nine months. Nine months. Yeah, yeah, maybe seven in some cases. I just had one recently. It was only like four, four months. But in general, let's average nine, seven to nine months. Um, <clears throat> my point was that you um, uh, can establish without having done any filing that this is my mark, this is my brand, this is my territory, my turf. I'm marking this. I haven't yet filed for federal registration, and I may not. I may decide that eh, I don't need to spend the money and I don't need the hassle, but I'm going to assert this brand for a while, see how it goes. And some people never file for federal registration and the TM is enough. You can send a takedown letter mm -hmm. with just a TM to this business show or uh, that business shoe or you know, if someone <laughs> right. says, comes out with shoe brands. You can still send them a takedown letter without having any federal registration at all. See, right now I'm, I'm building a number of domains around that, like you know, the website That Business Network. My when I talk real estate, I say go to thathomevaluation.com or that home search. So I'm building this kind of whole brand around this and that and that, 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 that. So I don't know. I mean, how you know marketable or how defensible is my use of the word that, that, that? Do I have to go out there and get all those trademarked to That Business Network? 
work, that business this, that business that. Let's talk about an example that I'll use that you've all heard of. Uh, it was There was a series of books called Blank for Dummies, uh, HTML for Dummies, uh, Series 7 for Dummies. There's patents for right. dummies, uh, which I read. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, that was a trademark brand which spanned a variety of categories, but yes, to protect his rights, I believe that person filed on several of his uh, separate product names. In your case, Jamie, it depends. If you take outside investors, if you get enough brand cachet where your company is really flowing in a, a high amounts of revenue, sure. You know, I'll give you an example. Donald Trump, before he became president, filed on all kinds of uh, brand identities, some of which didn't necessarily do all that well. Mm -hmm. But because he was so liquid, the filing costs were kind of minimal to him. Is that even a business out there where people will file things and then try to sell them back to the public, sort of like domain names? They go out there, register all these domain names, and then try to sell them to people, even though they're not even going to use them? Not really, Jamie, because with a federal registration, you have to prove you are using it in commerce. Okay, so it can't be a business then, because you got to actually be using it. Then. Well, you're supposed to, but people fake and fudge around that and whatnot and kind of pretend, well, I'm going to go into Google Motor Oil or I'm going to go into Google uh, oh, Ballpoint Pens or something. And then they put up a site and sell two or three ballpoint pens and then say, write Google a letter, say, look, you know, if you want, you know, to us to relinquish this brand, you got to write us a nice fat check. Right. It doesn't work real well. That's not a good business strategy. Don't recommend that, folks. But uh, <laughs> people do try to be a little cute and they fake. A actual specimen of use in commerce, but it's, it's not going to work. Currently talking to uh, Chris Tanner of Tanner Patent. Learn more at fireyourpatentattorney.com, which I am assuming applies, then hire him. So we'll talk about patents when we uh, come back from the break. Again, a good discussion on trademarks and some great information, you know, on my own trademark and learning that I need to put a little uh, registration trademark up there. But even when you begin to use your uh, trademark, make sure you put that TM there to give public notice that that is your mark. So some great information coming out of this segment. And again, when we come back from the break, we're going to talk about the patent side of the business with Chris Tanner of Tanner Patent and learn more, fireyourpatentattorney.com as well as tannerpatent.com, so multiple sites there. So currently listening to That Business Show 2.0 with your host, Jamie Maloney, where business becomes show business. Here's our primary business is hardwood flooring, although we are remodelers for kitchen, bath, and general construction. We operate a fleet of shop at home vans that have all the flooring type products, hardwood flooring, laminate flooring, tiles, stone, what have you. So we're able to come out first with products in our vehicles and take a look at the setting, how the colors will work, and then to be able to come up with some options and ideas for you. If that's not good enough, we have a large distribution center that we inventory product and have a nice display area. Jackie Skelton from JR World Travel here. If you travel, you need a licensed professional travel consultant, not a computer. Your licensed professional consultant can get you more for your time and your money. Value for your money and experience, not marketing salesmanship. When you're sick, you call the doctor. When you need legal advice, you call an attorney. So the next time you want to go on any type of travel, call your licensed professional travel consultant who actually represents you. We specialise in group travel, family reunions, weddings, to escorting large groups or making special arrangements for the disabled. Please call 844 249 0190. We are a full service travel consultancy offering worldwide concierge service. Air, land, sea, rivers, resorts, locally, nationally and internationally. Remember that number, 844-249-0190.
Hey everyone, welcome back to the all-new That Business Show 2.0, where business becomes show business. I'm your host, uh, Jamie Maloney, and we're here weekday morning, 7 a.m. on thatbusinessnetwork.com. So we're talking trademarks there in that first segment. Now we're going to switch topics and talk about the patent side of this business with Chris Tanner of Tanner Patent and learn more at fireyourpatentattorney.com. So first off, how does the patent process differ from the trademark process in getting a patent in place? It's a lot more complicated, and it takes a lot longer. Um, however, for a provisional patent disclosure, um, a simple one where someone has an important business show or something and they want to be patent pending ahead of it, it's actually cost less. Um, now I'm going to kind of divert slightly from your question a little bit and mention why I chose the URL fireyourpatentattorney.com. It's to arguably fire me, fire mm -hmm. all of them, do it yourself. Mm -hmm. I want to make everybody aware that I have seen some very, very fine professional finished patent disclosures from laypersons. Not very often, about, I would say about four out of every hundred or so are really polished and really good. Um, they don't need me, they don't need an attorney at all. And other kinds of patent disclosures with provisionals, which are a lot more informal and have a lot less rigorous uh, specific requirements from the patent office, like a PowerPoint demo that you're pitching to investors, throw that in an envelope or put it up online and uh, spend $65 and you can be patent pending and do that before you file. So my point is the choice of the URL, fire your patent attorney, is more to let people know Again, with all the legal information available to the general public, people are finding they can do a surprisingly high amount of their own legal protection work themselves. What about, though, that you don't know what you don't know, though? I mean, I can yeah. always read this, read this, this, okay, I know it now, but they're not telling me what I don't know, and it could get you in trouble, though, could it? It could. Yes, it could. You take a risk and doing this kind of thing without consulting with a professional. But I'm seeing more and more people, I'll just give the other example, I didn't bring my blood pressure meter, but it used to be no one ever took their own blood pressure and had a cuff at home and whatnot, and now you see them at CVS and Walmart and whatnot for under $40. And it's a valuable, useful thing for people you know, with diabetes or high blood pressure problems to be able to take their own blood pressure. By the same token, yeah, it used to be, it was a gigantic high risk for you to go out and kind of fool around and mess around in the patent system yourself. Uh, it was. It's changing. Mm -hmm. It really is changing. And you folks out there, you might be surprised that if you'll just follow some simple steps, some of which I explain on my website, uh, which involves not hiring me, firing me. And if you follow those steps, you can make yourself a pretty decent little patent disclosure. It will probably be only suitable for provisional and not for utility, but I'm an advocate of my people and my clients and people who never hire me being aware of legal self-help. The world has changed since 2017, and you would be surprised how much protection that you can at least start the process yourself and save money. So what do you want them to hire you for, though? you got to make money. you got to eat. <laughs> I don't have any for? problem finding <laughs> clients. Thank you. Yes, I do got to eat, although i probably eating a little too much. Um, the truth is that that's a start to the process, but there are so many other steps that in general, once they're self-initiated and comfortable with the process, when they come to me, I like them better as clients, they like working with me better, they have some idea of what my tasks and responsibilities are, and in general the relationship goes a lot better when they've kind of carried the ball a little ways down the field. Now does a patent uh, you know, take about 12 months to get done like a trademark, no. or is it different? How's that different? A lot longer. And yeah, that was your original question, and I mm -hmm. apologize to the no, show no, producers. No, I went off on answer to questions Jamie didn't ask. Getting back to that, yes, a uh, patent probably, when I was an examiner in general, I worked on patent applications that were filed more than four years earlier. Wow, that long. Yeah, unfortunately in telecommunication and computer networking and systems and also different software and computer implemented applications, again, we're the commercial center of not just the United States, the entire world, the United States patent offices, and uh, so they file more in the United States often than they do in their own country because mm -hmm. the protection's better. And the scope and the ability to assert in a licensing relationship is far better. What about things in areas of like, you know, medicine and research where they want to file a patent, but they, they, they don't even know if the product even works or something. Do they file a patent ahead of the actual testing and research to even validate what they have? Yeah, they take a guess. They forecast. You know, a good example, medicine and research and ph pharmaceutical 
chemicals even before they've completed stage three FDA testing. They'll probably have filed maybe 20 applications. Um, these are companies that are sufficiently cash rich to af afford to do so, leaving aside Valiant, mm -hmm. who, by the way, filed a whole bunch of bogus patents on stuff that we now know doesn't work. They just assumed it would. Let's file on it. And if it turns out to not work, okay, scrap that one. But you have to kind of forecast not just what the invention does now, but how it will work in two years. And in a lot of cases, that involves guessing. And how do you file patents on things that are chemical creations like medicine? I remember years ago that the, the fragrance company, something that they were saying, you can't patent a fragrance, you know, I mean, because it's a specific chemical formula and you could tweak just one little, you know, uh, ingredient to that and it doesn't it change the entire, you know, patent process at that point because it's not the exact same chemical makeup, but it's very similar to the product that you're producing. I wonder, I see the question and you're opening up Oh, but how to make a short answer. Tough question to give a short answer to, but yeah, that could be, let's say they did file on a fragrance. It could be a hard to enforce particular disclosure, which in the end they may feel like we even trying to protect that was a waste. Do you remember of money. that brand? It ran probably about 15 years ago, something of war or something, but that was their thing. They were saying, it smells like Calvin Klein, you can't patent a fragrance, so buy ours, it's like, you know, <laughs> you know, half price or something, you know, so. Oh, you're talking now imitation and knockoff yes. kind of strategy. Mm -hmm. Well, you're partly right, Jamie, that you would probably have a great deal of difficulty getting a fragrance itself through the patent office examination process, but you can certainly pack patent and protect method of manufacturing, shipping, and distributing a fragrance, right. and also the additives and oils and compounds that go into making it effective. I'll give you an example. Uh, oh, I can't think of who's a popular fragrance manufacturer. S.D. Lauder. If we were doing a quick patent search, S.D. Lauder is likely filed, or under their holding company or their chemist company, they've likely filed on some aspect of the fragrance process. Maybe not the fragrance directly itself, right? but things surrounding the process that are novel, unique, innovative, and give them a commercial and advantage. And when they file those, these patents, do they have to tell the exact chemical formula that goes into these different products and these different medicines? Is there any, is that, because that's a trade secret, right? I mean, that's a whole other area of this kind of thing, the trade secret side. Well. <laughs> and they're giving it to the government who could one day steal all that information, I guess. <laughs> well, they're giving it to the government, but also all patent applications eventually get published, either after 18 months after after filing or when the thing issues. At that point, yes, you, everyone here that files for patent is giving a roadmap to their competitors on how to make, build, and use their invention. That's true. But very few people reverse engineer competitors' inventions from the patent disclosure. You're supposed to tell all of the best modes of how it works, but patent disclosures are such a terse, odd, strange, almost close to non-English-like expression that it's hard. You really, if you're concerned about a uh, competitor reverse engineering your products, it's probably likely going to come from taking the actual product itself, not from doing that from the patent disclosure, although I have heard of it being done from patent disclosures too. That's rare though. And there's uh, uh, innovators out there like Elon Musk who are such an innovator, they're like, I don't need a patent. Here's how I do everything. Do it and make it better because he uses the, uh, the uh, analogy that, you know, we're all on a sinking ship. It's best to hand everybody buckets, you know, than trying to do it, you know, by yourself with one bucket and stuff. So Elon Musk is an excellent example of somebody who doesn't even kind of keep that stuff to himself. He puts out all his designs out there to his competitors and says, here, make them better. But nobody's able to do it, though. <laughs> there is a certain industry, and when you have a strategic visionary like that, where that business model works. I don't necessarily say that that would work for every listener for this show, but that's an example of some where it Yeah, no, that's works. in the extreme areas of technology and stuff. Yeah, if, you, if you're you know, an individual and you make a little product or something, yeah, you probably don't want to implement that strategy. You probably put you out of business. <laughs> so. But, Jamie, let me follow on that, though, and this is probably the most important thing I'll say in the entire show, and I know our time is ticking down, so let, I really like to get this thought out. In a lot of cases, a lot of cases, L-O-T of cases, my inventors and my clients that file for patents, spent significant money and tried to get protection, end up regretting it. It doesn't help them at all. The product never reached anywhere near the sales thresholds they thought it were going to. They ended up losing a lot of money on the product and on the patents, and they had no licensee interest whatsoever. In general, I can give you many examples, more than 40, where the people who spent money on patents wasted their time, wasted their money. Make sure you understand what a patent can do for you and can't. This is not for the Elon Musk reasons. This is just for the reason that they were patenting something that nobody wants to buy and customers weren't interested is in. Is there a certain industry that benefits more so from patents or is that across the board? Well, the industry would be 
I don't, uh, hard to say on an industry specific level, but I will say on a revenue specific level, once someone's moving, let's say a quarter million dollars a year of inventory or even a hundred grand of inventory, probably they should get some protection because the costs to get there are, you know, not, uh, how shall I say, a great hindrance to their uh, revenue flow. But for someone who's never sold a unit of product, and I have several, some of whom not sold a unit of product in four years that they filed for utility patent. Why? What are you protecting? There is no sales resulting from this product. So I see people misunderstanding the patent system and what it's gained for. The commercial system of whether someone wants to buy a product or not is over here. The patent system is over here. There's often no intersection whatsoever. And that's a hard point to get across. People think that if you patented it, that must mean it has some commercial advantage. Not at all. Let me finish, give you three examples. There's a patent on a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. There's a patent on a method of exercising a cat with a laser pointer. And there's a patent <laughs> held by a four-year-old, a method of swinging on a swing. Just because it's patented doesn't mean that there is some kind of commercial uh, gain or threshold level at which this must be a sellable invention. Not at all. That is not what we think of when we're in the examination side of the patent process trying to decide should I stamp this allowable or not. That does not enter into the examiner's consideration, nor does it enter into a licensee's consideration. Good information. Well, Chris, really appreciate you being on the program today. Great information on trademarks and patents. And you can learn more at fireyourpatentattorney.com or reach out to them, 917-396-7351. Again, 917-396-7351. And again, you've been listening to the all-new That Business Show 2.0. I'm your host, Jamie Maloney, where business becomes show business. Welcome to Jaegers. We just want to take a minute and show you what we're all about. Uh, at Jaegers, our primary business is hardwood flooring, although we are remodelers for kitchen, bath, and general construction. We operate a fleet of shop-at-home vans that have all the flooring-type products, hardwood flooring, laminate flooring, tile, stone, what have you. So we're able to come out first with products in our vehicles and take a look at the setting, how the colors will work, and then to be able to come up with some options and ideas for you. If that's not good enough, we have a large distribution center that we inventory product and have a nice display area.
Hey everyone, Jamie Molinier, host of That Business Show 2.0, where business becomes show business. Each morning we talk with many different business professionals, entrepreneurs, political and community leaders in an effort to inspire you to step outside of the box and follow your passion and do something that you love because you will find that many of these people on this program came from a place of uncertainty and stepped into a wealth of ideas and income as well. So be, uh, definitely uh, tune into the program each weekday morning at 7 a.m. to get inspired on the all-new That Business Show 2.0. So on today's program, I'm talking with Michael Mendes. He is the founder and CEO of Tasty Minstrel Games. So interestingly enough, we'll be talking about games today. So learn more at playtmg.com. And we're also going to be talking a lot about business as we always do on this program as he's turned a love for games and hobby board games into a million dollar business with a unique hierarchy structure that uh, makes it for a very fun working environment as well. So Michael, welcome to the program today. Oh. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be on, Jamie. Absolutely. So first off, tell me, first off, just about Tasty Minstrel Games. What is this about? So we make hobby board games. Um, so the easiest way for me to explain that, I think, is that we make games uh, for the kind of people that have fun bending a spreadsheet to their will. Uh, so if that's part, partially your idea of fun, many of the games that we make, more complicated games, are kind of thing you would like. Now, these are all original games. These aren't derivatives of, you know, the well-known board games or anything. So these are all unique creations. Am I correct? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So give me an example of one. You use the uh, term spreadsheets and nobody ever really associates spreadsheets and gaming together. How do you tie spreadsheets and gaming together? Oh, it's just that the type of person that, that really, like, they want a result uh, in my experience, if they, if they want a particular result and they're going to use a tool like a spreadsheet, they're also the type of person who would like our games. That, that's why I use that example. Okay, all right. So give me an example of, uh, you know, how the game is played or the games are played and again, people can learn uh, about these games uh, for themselves at playtmg.com. But uh, give me an example of some of your products that are out there on the market. Okay. Uh, Martian Dice is a, uh, a game that is very accessible. Now, this is Everyone can like this. Uh, you roll dice. You choose what uh, things you're going to keep. Uh, you are Martians invading and, and abducting cows and chickens and humans because you want to determine <laughs> who the actual leaders of the world are. Uh, so there's that game. Uh, there are games like Orleans, which is a, uh, a, a $60 more uh, intense building up of your resources and utilizing those resources to do different things. Uh, those are a couple of examples. Now at Play TMG, how does this work? People go to the website and then they can download these games for a fee. Is that how the uh, the, the model works? Uh, no, they're, they're physical games okay. in real life. We don't have any digital versions. Okay, so it's not digital. Okay. The way that they uh, w so there's no downloading it except by going to a a local hobby store um and and purchasing it that's where most of our games are sold we saw a lot of games on kickstarter uh when we first are preparing to get them manufactured and whatnot okay i can remember growing up with all the different board games and everything it seems in today's digital age though everything's either through a play system or it's online so you're designing still physical game products that people can go and play what is your best seller out there what's what's the most popular game out there that people may know uh so the of the games that we make our our best sellers are uh, dungeon roll eminent domain orleans uh, eminent domain that doesn't have any does that have to do with the housing issue eminent domain or is that just the name no, of that okay it's just the name of a. Uh, i'm a realtor you say eminent house. domain it, it sparks a whole other set of talking points with me Sam. but, but uh, go ahead yeah. so all right uh, so so it's a it's a science fiction game and you are uh you are taking over the people's planets um you are exerting your you know, science fiction future taking over the planet version of eminent domain. Now, how I've never been. I, I remember growing up being in the games and the the Nintendos and you know got the PlayStation and then I was into the board games and you know today I'm not a, a gamer at all. I don't play board games. I don't play video games. And but I, I'm just curious about how those two markets uh, 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 interact or coincide with one another. The people that like you know digital games and the Nintendos and the Playstations versus the board games are those two totally separate markets um i would say that everybody who likes board games likes video games not everyone who likes video games will like board games or realizes that they should like board games 
and that's that's evidenced by the, the the scale of the industries, right? The the video game market is measured in the billions, and uh, the physical board game market is measured as a fraction of toys. Right, right, but it's so. nonetheless still a market out there and something that you've turned into a you know a seven figure uh, business here. Uh, you know what what got you started in this uh, in this business? Did you have a background in entrepreneurship and other businesses, and you went this direction, or was this the first time doing a business? Talk to me a little bit about that. Sure. So I, I'm 35. And I spent 30 years now uh, doing essentially three things, playing games, thinking about games, or being frustrated that it's <laughs> right. not the appropriate thing to either play or think about games at the moment. So I certainly had a lot of experience in that. And that was, uh, that was board games, that was video games, that was any game I could, that I had sufficient interest in. And so there's that. Um, I, I credit a lot of my desire to run a business to how I grew up with my father. So my father works at, as a financial advisor, and he started that when I was six months old. And one of my favorite things to do, probably from when I was uh, seven to 11, was to watch the nightly business report on PBS every night with him. At seven years old, huh? <laughs> was it more just you want to be with your father or you actually enjoyed the content? <laughs> uh, yes, both. Oh, okay. Actually. All right. All right. Um, and so, and he used to manage a grocery store. He's very customer uh, service con uh, con con conscious. I don't know how to say it. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I was saying it right. <laughs> it's a tough word. Yeah. I service conscious. Like yes. Um, and so just, consistent lessons from him on a regular basis, going out, uh, trying businesses, selling things. When I uh, played Magic the Gathering a lot, well, I didn't uh, sell uh, Magic cards for the purpose of uh, making money. I certainly traded very aggressively with an eye towards value and helping the person that I was uh, interacting with to where I would get more, mm -hmm. uh, in my opinion. Um, or, you know, but that we both felt that it was a good deal. Uh, that experience helped out. Uh, there's a lot of things that I've done over the years. I ended up working with my father as a financial advisor starting when I was 24 uh, for seven years. And, uh, yeah, that worked out really well, too. Uh, so, yeah. And then you so you started the TMG brand, and how long before you started to you know make you know, some money, make it stable? Was it something that happened immediately, or was it something that took maybe a year or two, or even five years or more to develop a brand? So uh, I started TMG started in 2009, and I was married. I still am married, same to the same lovely lady. I had two small kids at that time. I had four still young kids uh, now. Mm -hmm. And I was working as a financial advisor, very successful. My wife wanted to stay at home with our kids. I wanted to enable that if I could. So while I would come home and, and I was doing very well and enjoyed it and, and was good at, at being a financial advisor, right? Mm -hmm. I uh, would come back occasionally and see a, a situation where I'm like, oh, but it's not games. And, and eventually she said, you know, I, we're going to be together a very long time. I don't want to hear about this for the rest of our lives. So you got to do something about that. I start, So I started in 2009, but I was not going to jump in until it could support my family. Like jump in as in not, right. not working as a financial advisor anymore, right? So that took until uh, 2014, the first time I hired someone. Uh, and so... It took five years, mm -hmm. and but I was I was trying. I was very risk averse to not being able to provide for my family. How was the the product line? We've always proceeded by me. So, one of the things about me as a uh, as a person who loves games is that when I find a game that I love, I want to make it and make it available to people as long as I know how. So, if it's a video game, I don't know how to do that. Um, with that said. That means that we make as many games as we can stand to make and have the capability to make up to our quality standards. That has expanded over the years. Over the 
eight years that or is it nine years over the time we've been running it is a um what is it it's we, we've made about 50 games mm -hmm. and we can make uh we can make 10 to 15 new games a year without too much trouble. Now, I've got to take a break here, but I want to uh, come back from the break and learn about your management structure, your team structure, the development of these games. How do the ideas come from, you know, inside your head to actual product and, and what markets you're having great success in selling these? Because I was looking at this and thinking it was a digital version, but it's an actual physical product. And in today's environment, you don't see it. Meant a lot of people actually producing physical, tangible products anymore. And so it's always exciting to talk to people that are putting things out there on the marketplace, how they develop them, how how they get their funding for them and how they get retail operations to want to sell their products. So all that stuff, we'll talk with Michael when we come back from the break. And again, currently talking to Michael Mendes, founder and CEO of Tasty Minstrel Games. And you can see his product and learn more at that website, Play. TMG.com. And you also learn more about this program at thatbusinessnetwork.com. We've redesigned the old site there, so the old Tampa Bay radio site pushes over to this new site. So be uh, take a look at it. It's uh, just uh, in its infancy, so I just started building it uh, last week. But it's got some of the bells and whistles on it that we had before, but a lot more to go and a lot more to come on that site. So be sure to keep an eye on that. And, of course, new episodes air each weekday morning at 7 a.m. on the site, Eastern Standard Time, made available on demand on iTunes and on YouTube. You're listening to That Business Show 2.0 with Jamie Maloney, where business becomes show business. Hi, welcome to Yeagers. We just want to take a minute and show you what we're all about. Uh, at Yeagers, our primary business is hardwood flooring, although we are remodelers for kitchen, bath, and general construction. We operate a fleet of shop-at-home vans that have all the flooring-type products, hardwood flooring, laminate flooring, tiles, stone, what have you. So we're able to come out first with products in our vehicles and take a look at the setting, how the colors will work, and then to be able to come up with some options and ideas for you. If that's not good enough, we have a large distribution center that we inventory product and have a nice display area. Jackie Skelton from JR World Travel here. If you travel, you need a licensed professional travel consultant, not a computer. Your licensed professional consultant can get you more for your time and your money. Value for your money and experience, not marketing salesmanship. When you're sick, you call the doctor. When you need legal advice, you call an attorney. So the next time you want to go on any type of travel, call your licensed professional travel consultant who actually represents you. We specialise in group travel, family reunions, weddings, to escorting large groups or making special arrangements for the disabled. Please call 844-249-0190. We are a full service travel consultancy offering worldwide concierge service. Air, land, sea, rivers, resorts, locally, nationally and internationally. Remember that number, 844-249-0190.
And welcome back to That Business Show 2.0, where business becomes show business. I'm your host, Jamie Maloney, and we're here weekday mornings with new episodes on thatbusinessnetwork.com, 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and then on demand on iTunes and on YouTube. So we're talking about the gaming business today. We're talking about physical games, actual hobby board games with Michael Mendes, founder and CEO of Tasty Minstrel Games, and learn more at playtmg.com. And Michael, you're saying, you know, in that last segment that you have the ability to make 10 to 15 different games per year. Who are who's come up with these ideas? Are you making the ideas and telling people to make them, or does the team say, "Here's something I want to make"? So, for the most part, inside of uh, TMG, we do not design games that we are going to be publishing um, because that that work is on the more speculative end, uh, and it's it can be pretty intense. Uh, we license people's games, so I, I like to think that we do. Uh, like what a, a book publisher, like a Simon and Schuster or a Scholastic, would do for books, we do that for physical games. Okay. Game. Okay. So people that are out there listening that has a game could then call you up uh, after seeing you here on this program and say, "Hey, I have this idea. I'd like to pitch it to you." So is that something that uh, you would be open to, sort of like a uh, publisher? Hey, I got this book. Can we get this to market? So that's how TMG operates. Yes, they could. Uh, they need to have come in with the understanding that they'll probably be rejected. Uh, as with most uh, books, it's a lot of work to get something to a point where we feel like it could be something. It might not even be ready yet, but we would know how to take it that last, you know, 15 yards or whatever it is. Now, what makes a game successful on the marketplace? What are some of the things that you're looking for in a game? Is I mean, there's only so many games uh, out there and variations of different types of models. I mean, what does well out there on the marketplace? What are you looking for when designers then come to you? So we're, we're in, in, in an interesting situation. We don't try to guess what's going to be good. So the, the simple answer to what makes a good game in the commercial sense is sales. Um, but we make games that we like and, and we feel that uh, our customers would like and appreciate and would not be upset if they bought it from us. Those are the games we're going to make. And so what we do is we work on making it as cost effective as possible for us to make those games. Uh, and now, are you looking for people with a in the marketplace? Sorry. Are you looking yeah. for people that have games that have a track record of sales that you can like you can see, or are you willing to work with somebody who you you think that's a great idea and you'd like to market it? Uh, what are you looking for though when people are coming to you? So we, we work with we work with people who have finished game designs that are not published usually. Uh, if something had been published before, it needs to have fallen out of contract. It needs to have you know demand out there our, our print runs are typically two to three thousand units uh at first if we uh, if something is selling really well we'll print more as needed uh but we we work really hard to be able to test new things in the marketplace where the data is actually customers making purchasing decisions as opposed to saying oh yeah i like that right right now yeah, we'll buy it mm -hmm. No, now, well, what about well, retail operations? You actually buy it. What about the uh, retail operations? And you mentioned you put stuff out on Kickstarter and maybe Indiegogo, the different crowdfunding sites that are out there. Well, who is who are your resellers? Where are you having good luck with getting these products uh, out on the marketplace to? Right. So when we put something on a crowdfunding site, it's going to be to fund the game originally. Uh, we have built up over the years a relationship with the hobby uh, retailers through distribution and whatnot. So we, we sell them to distributors, distributors sell them to those retailers who might look like a comic shop. It might look like a, a trading card store. It might look like a board game store. It might look like a dungeon from the outside. Those are the kind of places where our games are sold. Mm -hmm. um, and then occasionally the uh, we've had games selling at Barnes & Noble. For example, I mean, do you see them inside Walmart's and Kmart's too, or no? no not in those not, operations. Not for us. Not in those operations. Okay. Now, crowdfunding has uh, enabled a lot of people to get otherwise unknown products off the market, uh, off to the market, I should say. How impactful has crowdfunding been for your business? For instance, if crowdfunding had not, you know, come into the marketplace, would your business have been as successful as it is today? 
Whether it would have been as successful or not, I'm not sure. Uh, it might be more successful, but I do know for a fact that it would require a lot more financial capital than we require as it is, uh, because we are able to collect on enough of the, the products that we make before we manufacture them. It's an incredible medium for marketing. I see so many people do well with it, but then again, I see so many people abuse the system and don't know really what they're doing. I'll see people put up there, you know, fund my trip to, you know, Africa or something. They just, people want you to pay for them to go, you know, go overseas and whatnot. How have you developed your, uh, your crowdfunding uh, campaigns? Have you developed like a, a community of followers that every time you put something out there, boom, you immediately start getting uh, returns? Yes. And, and we, we, we speak, to uh to these individuals mostly through email at this point in time we email twenty seven thousand people mm -hmm. all of whom are uh, basically all of whom have bought something from us before right it's right very rare that someone that we're emailing is not an actually uh, a customer who's bought something from us so we get really really good response rates and how soon before you were able to build up that response of a, a community? Was it something that took a, you know, a year or two to kind of get uh, built up? Because again, I see so many people that go into crowdfunding with something, they don't really have a plan. They just, they just put it up there. Uh, we've been building it for eight years, person by person, basically uh, selling products that people like. They respect what we do. Uh, we are on the various ways, the various like open forum sort of places that uh, the people that we want to, our customers would hang out. We mm -hmm. are very open about what we do. Hey, there was a problem. Oh, sorry, let's we solve it. Uh, and what is, after, what do you typically- After a long time, it, it builds up. What do you typically, what's a typical game then raise when you put it out to Kickstarter for yourself? What's a typical uh, uh, income for that? So a uh, pledge level that it, it, it ranges quite widely. Uh, we we often see projects go over hundred thousand. Wow. Uh, we've had uh, we've had a we have had three games now that have gone over two hundred and fifty thousand. Wow! Uh, our, one of one of which we did in May of last year that went was like four hundred and sixty. Uh huh. Uh, and two of those. Actually, all three of them share a very interesting characteristic in that the uh, the value that surprisingly, well, surprise, surprise, the value that the customer gets for what they're paying is actually higher than most, mm -hmm. right? And uh, two of those are very, in a very specific way. One of them was back in 2013. That was Dungeon Roll, and it was, I mean, it was a it was a game I was selling for. I think I was selling it for $16 or something like that. Mm -hmm. I had priced it and there was $2 of profit per unit uh -huh. on the the uh, on the crowdfunding project. My goal was to fund a print run and get uh, popularity behind it for when it hit retail. That worked out well for us. And um, the other two are a little bit different where we are getting essentially a slightly discounted from full MSRP price and then a, a bonus pack where the bonus pack is like $20, mm -hmm. but it costs us $20. It, it might not cost us $20. It could cost us $18. It could cost us $22 by the end, depending on what we're comfortable with, uh, to actually make and deliver that. So we're talking about really big upgrades in, in our now, do you like use just wood and metal coins and all this other stuff? Do you just use Kickstarter for your crowdfunding platform? Because, I mean, there's Indiegogo and there's GoFundMe and others as well. Do you just use Kickstarter? Do you put them out on the different platforms? We've not used anything other than Kickstarter yet. Just Kickstarter. And is there a particular reason that you like and recommend Kickstarter? Or is that what you just got started with and that's what you stay with? Uh, it's what we've used for six years. So that's... Um, you know, we're open to experimenting with things and we might in the near future, but uh, yeah. Now tell me about your management style. I was reading your bio and you talk about a unique hierarchy structure that kind of takes away the, the different levels of, you know, a management. Tell me a little bit about how you run your company. Sure. It, it, comes, from an, it comes from a couple of ideas here. Number one, uh, I know that I personally don't respond well to people telling me what to do. Uh, 
Uh, and that extends even to myself telling me what to do, right? <laughs> hey, here's right. a to-do list, uh, future Michael. And I, future Michael says, past Michael, what are you doing? Right, right. Uh, and so that's one idea. The other one is, you know, bear in mind that on the business end, I have had help on the product end uh, from the beginning. But on the business end, I have run everything. And I was coming in from a standpoint of, you know, if, if I need to have a person essentially be an extra hand for me or an extra two hands and I tell them what to do and they just do it, uh, then I might as well do it myself. Right. Uh, so, and how many people are in your, there. how many people are, do you employ or across your team, should I say? So there's 11 people now. And it makes uh, for a very fun one, and, and cohesive, uh, cohesive environment. Yeah. One, one of them is uh, part time. And, but it's, there is, other than myself, there's one person who actually is kind of like a quote unquote manager, but there's very little that is managed. It's more of a, uh, a servant sort of position. Hey, everybody else who works at TMG, what do you need? And I will help you with it. Very right? good. And that's the, the same way that, that I have uh, acted in the past. He just happens to be able to also do that for just about everything inside the company. So, All right. Well, we got to wrap up the show. Michael Mendes, uh, founder and CEO of Tasty Minstrel Games. Great information on games as well as crowdfunding. So I got a lot out of this uh, show, and I'm sure you did as well. And you can learn more about him, playtmg.com. So, Michael, thank you so much for being with me today. Thanks, Jimmy. It's my and pleasure. Again, learn more about this program at thatbusinessnetwork.com. And if you'd like to come onto the program, visit tbsinterview.com. So again, you've been listening to That Business Show 2.0. I'm your host, Jamie Maloney, where business becomes show business.